What's new? Oh, dude, like mad sprint, um, as I am sure it is for you and yours, to yeah. this big tourney in Orlando. Um, did you cover your camera by chance? Did I cover it? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it went great. Oh, yeah. Oh, my bad. <laughs> that is a testament to how long it's been since we did this. Yeah, right? It's yeah. been too long, but... Uh, I feel I feel like it was needed in moments, uh, but I also I also feel like uh, you know it, it could have come back sooner. Um, we could have probably had these conversations a little sooner with Mark or sure. whoever else we have on. But um, yeah, this is a good one to start us off. I think uh, having Mark on, he's used social media as a platform to really you know, push his message and, you know, the message of Black Lives Matter and he's been at the protest. And so I think he's a perfect person. Uh, and he's, and he's a guy who, you know, we know and we're comfortable with. And I think it's a, it's a good starter to have these kind of difficult conversations. Let's get into it. Thanks for coming on, Mark. Really appreciate it. Um, you know, this has been pushed back uh, a few times and I apologize. I think and you know, I for me, I, yeah, I can't speak, I can't speak for Larry, but to be completely <laughs> honest, subconsciously a little bit of his, his, uh, you know, anxiety about kind of starting this conversation. And I know you've been very vocal. You've been interviewed a number of times and, um, you've been a, a huge advocate and a huge, um, leader in, uh, not only the community, but LAFC in our locker room. And I see that and I, respect that and I love it um and in the last few weeks for me it's it's been a little different I feel like I've you know haven't been as present on social media and haven't we haven't done shooting the shot for a while and we've had some lined up but haven't felt that it was appropriate to release them and um you know uh I didn't want to also take up space and I felt like um I needed to listen and learn and really understand first before moving forward and so really stoked to have you on. And, um, and again, you know, as much as get people and myself are worried about saying the wrong thing, um, you know, it's, it's more important, um, that we don't miss this opportunity and, and we have these conversations. Um, and so, you know, we've used this platform as, as a space to learn about everybody's connection to LAFC. Um, but I think, you know, now and moving forward, I think it should go deeper and, we should have these, you know, uncomfortable conversations. And, um, you know, I talk to you a lot and you're a leader in our locker room. And, and so I'm super grateful to have you on and to kind of start this conversation. No, I appreciate it. Yeah. I, I agree with you on the time that you're saying that, you know, sometimes we have to take a step back and let other things, you know, take, uh, the focus, especially on media platforms. And that was kind of what we were talking about with, with my show too. I just felt like, you know, I needed to just, you know, allow LAFC as a, a club and a culture to use their platform for the, the most good possible. And yeah, you know, once things start to get a little bit better, then we can start injecting ourselves back into everything because you do want to res- like resort to, or go back to the way, things were just a little bit better yeah I was talking to Larry um for a while and um you know at this time I just try to soak up as much information as possible and there was this podcast with Doc Rivers the basketball coach and Mm -hmm. um he talked about you know how he speaks with his players and he wants to approach the conversation in a way that um you know he tells his players to to speak up but don't become the story and I yeah. think that's super important to not shift the focus from what's important and, and stay the course, but just kind of magnify that. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I thought that was awesome. And, um, you know, hopefully we can do that. Yeah. And for me, Mark, um, being probably older than the two of your combined ages. Um, <laughs> I don't know, Larry, you know, <laughs> I bring that way up. <laughs> I still think of you as a young guy, Harvey. Um, you know, I, I grew up in the 1960s and Mm -hmm. still can, you know, remember 
as a young person, um, you know, John F. Kennedy was shot when I was a baby. Martin Luther King was assassinated when I was a young kid. There were riots in Chicago that summer. Uh, my aunt was the only white school teacher oh, in wow. an all black school uh, in the city of Chicago at the time. And what has struck me the most and Hari and I have talked about it is it's now close to, it's 50 years later. And unfortunately, if we're reflective and introspective and critical about ourselves as a society, it, it sure looks but like by all measures, we've actually gone backwards. Mm -hmm. And so to Harvey's point, sitting back and just listening, but also engaging in these conversations has become so important because one of the messages that I have heard most from folks, um, and one of them is a former UCLA teammate of Harvey's, um, guy who played in MLS and is now uh, an executive at Adidas, uh, Scott Thompson. You know, one of the things he said to me was, when things calm down, and likely they will, please do me a favor and don't stop talking about this and don't stop working for change. So here we are. And I, and I guess the question to you, Mark, you've been uh... – you know, you've been a part of these peaceful protests, um, you know, seeing the pictures and everything. What have those been like? What is the energy like, the environment like out there? Um, you know, I think they've, they've died down a little bit since we mm -hmm. last spoke about it. Yeah, no, they were, uh, you know, it was a cool experience to be a part of. Um, I, I didn't plan to, to join any of the protests. It was more like, like, you know, I'm just at home with Rachel and then I, I can start hearing the helicopters and all that stuff. And I look out my, my balcony and, you know, there's a mass of people and I'm like, you know what? Well, I should be there. You know what I mean? And quickly we make a sign out of cardboard and we run down there. And I remember the actual first time we, we joined the protest, we had to run like four or five blocks to get with the mass of people because we brought the dog and, um, she just wasn't being good around everyone. She didn't want to walk. So we had to go all the way upstairs and then get back. But there was just that, you know, that energy that you, you wanted to be a part of this big voice. And like, we didn't want to miss it. We didn't want to be too far behind. We wanted to be in the thick of everything. And it was just cool to see so many people come together. And it wasn't just black people there. There was every race, ethnicity of people there. And for them to come together and to fight for their quality uh, of a race that has been undermined in a long time. It was really heartfelt seeing all that. And, you know, obviously there are people there who are born leaders and, you know, they can take control of protests and they know what to say and stuff like that. And, you know, I give a lot of credit to those people because it's not easy because when I went with the LAFC, the LAFC 3252 one, it, it was not easy at all. Like, you know, they asked me to say something in front of a group of people and I was not ready. You know, but I just had to realize, like, this is something I'm passionate about. I, it's not like I need to write a speech or anything. I just got to talk from my heart. And, um, you know, that it was just cool to know that so many people want to be part of this change. And it felt so genuine. And seeing, I remember telling Rachel, like, the people have so much power. Like, just seeing all these people stand in front of City Hall and, just looking at these cops and these cops aren't bad, you know, not all of them, but just realizing how many more of us there are than them. It was like, we have a lot more power than we think. And then starting to see where all these protests are happening all over the world in countries where there might be the percentage of black people are at a, like under 1%, you know what I mean? And they're out there protesting too. So it's just like, the, because it became a world movement, I started to realize like, okay, I think, you know, we have something here. I think there was, there's enough people involved that there should be a good amount of hope for change. So it, it was a good experience and I'm glad that I, I was a part of it. Something that I'm 
interested in, and I think people generally would be interested in, you didn't grow up in this country. Correct. And so, for example, we have spent some time as an organization, um, you know, having these conversations. And we invited Cookie Johnson, Magic's wife, to join us Mm -hmm. for one of those conversations. And she talked about some of the lessons that, unfortunately, she and her husband needed to pass on to their children. Mm -hmm. And that included things like, well, if you're out driving at night and you're driving one of the family cars that happens to be nice and you get pulled over for nothing, you know, here's how you need to behave. And I'm just, I'm curious, growing up in a big city like Toronto Mm -hmm. that has diversity, um, were these things that your parents felt compelled based upon society in Toronto at the time that they needed to share with you? Or was it less of an issue, less prevalent? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, when I think about it now, uh, I don't think my mom ever had a conversation with me about police or anything like that. And the conversation she would have with me and my brothers would be like, follow the rules, don't break the laws, like, you know what, don't be out late doing stupid things, like normal things, you know yeah. what I mean? We never had, when I look back at it now, like, the cops were cool with us. You know what I mean? Like, I remember one time where I was in high school and I think we were just roaming around a neighborhood and a cop car stopped us because they had heard that there's kids causing a ruckus. You know what I mean? And they come, they talk to us, we sit down, they talk to us. Next thing you know, we're taking photos with them, posing on their cop cars. Like, that's how it was. It was like that. Sure, there's crime in Toronto and stuff, but I don't think there was that much of a need for parents to talk to their their kids about how they should act you know it was like just don't you think break that's the a law you, just you think ahead. that's a product of of canada and and kind of i mean i've lived there i lived there for seven years they're very accepting yeah. of all ethnicity sexual preferences and everything do you think yeah. that's a product of just you know canada and, and the diversity that that it has yeah like i don't think canada is perfect but i think when it comes to this idea of racism and how people are treated i think they are a step ahead of the u.s and i think when we are a step ahead you know parents don't have to take those precautions with their kids you know you don't hear a lot of things where kids are getting pulled over because of their skin color you know if you are doing something that you're not supposed to be doing and you get pulled over you you know why you got pulled over you know and that was kind of how it was growing up in toronto and i I, I experienced both sides of it. I went to a school that was predominantly more white than black, you know, and not, there was never problems with cops there. And then also same thing. My brother's high school was more predominantly black than white. Um, still like maybe three miles away from each other. And I am that far and no issues whatsoever. So now when I see all this, I'm like, this is crazy, you know, to me, because growing up, I never had this worry that much. Right. So um, in that sense, yeah, it's we never had to. I, I don't remember one conversation my mom talking to me about cops like that. But then you moved to Louisville. Mm-hmm. Now, did you experience any sort of racism there? Yeah, there's racism there for sure. And I knew going into that, that like I needed to act a different way than how I acted when I was in Toronto. I knew that right away. It wasn't my home city. You know, I just wanted to get in and get out. I wanted to be like a passenger. You know, I didn't want to draw too much attention to me. And I do remember one time where, and this, this cop was super nice, but I remember we were leaving our training field and one of uh, my teammates, he's actually from a small town outside of Chicago. I forgot what it was called. Is it Rockford or something? Rockford. Yeah, man. Rockford. It's a perfect guy to to 90 90 minutes west. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, he was driving a car and he accidentally, he was making a left and a car was trying to make a left, like, and they hit each other. And it wasn't anything intense, but obviously we have to wait and the cops have to come. That's like protocol. And we're, it's me and 
there's three other, there's three black guys, including me and him. And we're kind of just standing there and we're like, okay, cops are coming. Like we're kind of making little jokes. And I think that's our way. And I've said this a lot. I think our way to get out of uncomfortable situations as humans, sometimes we try to find laughter in something that's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So we're making a joke like, okay, once this cop comes, like, don't do nothing, put your hands up. Like, you know, and we're kind of chuckling and stuff because we know we're innocent. We didn't do nothing, you know? But you're making and sure everyone's comes. aware that this situation is about to happen. Yeah. yeah. And then when the cop comes, we freeze. Like all this, like joking around, the cop comes and we are not saying one word, Jordan. Like not one word. And we're just like, it's like, I didn't know how to act because I was like, shit, like there's a good chance that like this could go the wrong way. And I never felt like that in Toronto. And luckily this cop was super nice. His daughter was a massive fan of Louisville city. And, you know, he spoke to us very nicely. But then I, even now, when I look back at that, I'm like, what if we weren't playing for Louisville city? Like, what if we weren't these professional athletes? Like things could have gone differently. So, um, yeah, my time in Louisville was very interesting in that sense. Obviously we were very close to Indiana and that's a state where it's like, we had to go there sometimes and I even told Rachel there's a time I went into some burger shop and I see a bunch of these people come in with Confederate flags. You can see it all over their trucks. And I was just like telling my teammates, like, I was just like, yo, let's just get our food and leave. We were going to eat there. I was like, let's just, this is their home. You know, I don't want to, it, it, I shouldn't have to feel like that, that I'm like, uh, a burden to them by just ordering something. But I was like, I don't want to even cause a situation by being here and we just left. So yeah, and now Louisville you, was a little different. Were there any conversations before you relocated to Louisville where family or friends or uh, you know teammates said, hey, this is going to be a different experience or was it you kind of learned it on the fly and didn't really expect it. Yeah, like I had an idea, you know, going in, I was like, first of all, I didn't know where Louisville was when I heard of the team. I didn't know where in the US it was, you know what I mean? Or I knew it was Kentucky, but I didn't know where it's situated on the map. Sure. And once I looked and I saw where it's situated, I was like, okay, let's, let's be more aware of things that I wasn't aware of in Toronto. And then when I got there, I had teammates who had been there for a while. Mm. And I, one of my best friends is from Toronto. He was on the team too. So we had a couple conversations about things that would go on, but I, I just was more hyper aware of everything. You know, I didn't try to change exactly who I am as a person, but it was just like, you need to be aware that some people don't agree with everything over here. And you just got to try and still live your life accordingly. And let's just all note for the record, that Louisville is the hometown of Muhammad Ali. Oh, yes. All right. Yeah. That is very that's true. A, that's, a, that's a good one. He, so, he got buried I, when I, I was actually there. He passed away. Yeah, he passed away when I was in Louisville. So they had his whole ceremony stuff. It was, the city was shut down. Like, wow. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you, had, you had brought up Rachel a bunch of times. Um, yeah. You know, and you had gone to the protests with her and um, experienced that with her. How was that? Yeah, was, it was. How, cool I mean, here. being oh, in a I, and you have and I have to say, yeah. Rachel's white, obviously. So yeah, being interracial, in a racial, couple. Yeah. yeah, is that like? A, you know, she impressed me a lot. I think it's, and we had a conversation about it yesterday too. I think because of people trying to, you know preach this change that needs to happen in the world, there's a target being put on white people's backs, which is not fair because not just because you're white means you're racist, you know? And for her to put herself in a situation where she's at the front of a line and she's chanting the same things everyone else is chanting beside her. I was like, this, this shows like how much power she has as a person. And she understands her ability in this context to make sure change comes right and she's influencing people in her life that maybe didn't have their eyes open to these certain problems so i i told her after this i was like i'm very proud of you and i'm glad to be associated with you because i she doesn't have to do that you know what i mean but she knows how passionate i'm at it and she puts herself right in the front you know 
So, yeah. uh, no, it, it's been amazing. She's been really good with that. And the fact is, like, she holds me accountable to certain things. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, it's good. It's, she's, she's done a good job. And I think it's, it's harder for her in this situation, you know? Um, but she did a good job, yeah. Now, you shared uh, a little bit of a story with me. I don't know if you're up for, for talking about it here, but, uh, you know, about her protesting and you protesting and how, you know, her being, you know, a white female and you being a black male, how it's like yeah. different and you have to worry about different circumstances. And if something was to, were to happen, what would, what would happen? Yeah. And how you'd have to react. Yeah. Yeah. So we realized that these cops, obviously, I think when they fear for their lives, they start to act out. And yeah, sure, it's dangerous sometimes at these protests because people are doing stupid shit. But they have these rubber bullets and, you know, they're just, some people are just on their own. And I remember talking to Rachel, it was, they switched the curfew that day. That was what I was telling you, Jordan. They had, the curfew yeah. was supposed to be at like six, right, Larry? And we're at City Hall. It's like 450 something. They switched the curfew to five. Right. <laughs> And we're like, oh, like, I don't live that far from City Hall, you know what I mean? Right. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is interesting. They're trying to get everyone to move. And I tell Rachel, I'm like, all right, like, we got to make sure that we're close enough to home that, like, if something happens, I can run home. Like, that's what I was telling her. Like, like she will be okay. Like, if I'm walking with her, and it was crazy because – if I was walking by myself on the street, I guarantee you a cop would have stopped me and said something. But the fact that I'm holding hands with her, they're like, oh, it's just like a couple going home. You know what I mean? And we look like we're not causing any pro But we were at the protest. We have a sign. But if it was me by myself, and this is what I'm telling Rachel, I'm like, listen, like, if something happens, like, you know how to get home. Like, I got to run home. Like, I can't, like, you know, that was, that was it. And yeah. when we left, when we left, and I was telling Jordan this, the cops tried to like barricade everyone in with these huge like tow trucks. And yeah. we got out just in time, like just in time we got out and I see all of them and they gave us this look like, oh, you're lucky. You know, <laughs> like they were looking at us like with this kind of like, what you got, you got lucky this time. And it was just a weird experience. And I, I and it's not just between us, but I actually saw a lot of other white people wearing signs being like, if they start shooting, hide behind me like I'm your human shield like that's what people were like were, were holding posters and stuff like that because they know the privilege they have you know what I mean and yeah. they're telling everyone else like we want to share this privilege with you if it comes down to that god forbid it does but yeah it was it was it was a weird time and Rachel was actually like a little scared you know and I was like I think I'm like babe you're you're okay like these guys aren't gonna do anything to you you know what I mean? Like, I'm the one who should be worried. But the fact I'm with you, I'm not scared at all. You know, <laughs> I just hold her hand and it's like, oh, they're just two people, you know, going on a lovely walk. And it, w it was weird that we came to that you know, idea. But yeah, that's the shit that happens sometimes. Were you, did, did you meet here or did you start dating in Louisville? No, we met here. We met here. So I met her um, last wow. August. So just before like that LA Galaxy game where I think we tied 3-3. Yeah, that one. Funny how we mark our lives by those games. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, I mean, you were talking about white privilege and, and I was talking to Larry about it. You know, I've had to have, I, I, we, we want to have in our household these conversations with, with our daughter and be open mm -hmm. and honest about everything. It started with COVID-19 and now it's, you know, about racism and, um, you know, I've been talking to a lot of friends and everything and, you know, it's like the first time we've talked about racism with our, with our daughter mm -hmm. and, you know, Kim and I are like, that's just like, that's like white privilege. You know, this is the first yeah. time and black yeah. people have had to have these conversations for years. Yeah. And, um, you know, you talked about how growing up in Canada, um, you know, it was a little different, but have you, you know, had to have these conversations with Rachel or any other of your white friends that, you know, like you had to prepare them for what might happen or, you know, if a cop was to pull you over, like how to act or you just said maybe you're, you know, you, you hold Rachel's hand you feel like that's a protective shield, you know, like is that, yeah. I mean, that's, it's crazy to think about, but have you had those conversations? 
Yeah, so I think I've had a couple conversations recently with Rachel about the idea that, you know, the, like, it's going to be, when we have kids, it's going to be different for them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, they were going to be mixed race kids. What she's used to growing up with is not going to be how they're going to be treated. Hopefully, they are going to be treated that way. I hope that's where the world is at that point. But I'm like, everything that's happening right now you have to understand that like we're fighting for this so that your children don't go through this. Right. Yeah. And that's a con. I, I was like, that's the reality of it. Like you're going to be scared when your son or your daughter goes out at, at, late at night or anything like that because of this color of their skin. And that was a conversation we had. And I think once she realized that that's when all, like she always was aware of her position on racism. But I think after that, she started to, put more passion and, and energy into it because she's like, okay, well, this is not okay for everyone going through it now. And I want to make sure it's eradicated so that my kids don't have to go through it. When it comes to my friends, they have gone through situations and we just, we'll talk about them. You know, like yeah. Richie has been in situations. I, um, Derek Etienne from Columbus was in a situation and Jordan Hamilton was in the car. So one of my friends, and we, we just, we talk about it and we, at the end of the day, we just say things need to continue to change, you know? And if we keep talking about it, people will be more aware of it. And then hopefully more people will join the fight. Um, with my white friends, I don't talk about it that much, you know, because I'm, I'm very grateful where I don't have to have certain, so many situations where I need to talk about something. Um, and I just give everyone the benefit of the doubt that they are, aware of everything going on but yeah i the conversation about the kids that's one where that's a tough one and you're talking about it now talking to harlow about it it's like it, it's a it's a weird conversation to have with a young kid you know yeah and i think it's i think it's one that you know just just so they're aware of it i think is yeah. the huge part and then you know, even myself, like educating myself on the history, you know, yeah. you know, Larry, like he said, he's a little older. So he was around for some of these, um, mm -hmm. you know, these events and some of these riots and some of these, um, you know, mass murders. Um, but like, I, I need to educate myself and, and Harlow on those, on those historic events that, you know, might not be in the books. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious, oh, Mark, also back to just, you know, growing up, in Toronto, mm -hmm. um, things like Martin Luther King, yeah. Malcolm X, the civil rights movement in the United States, was any of that part of the curriculum like when you were in high school? Yeah, we learned about everything. So I don't think there's a, a complete balance to how much American schools teach about Canadian history, but we know about everything. I might not have remembered it, but I know that I had to study everything. And um, yeah, with like, we celebrate Martin Luther King, you know, day, we have all that. And like, I actually grew up with a poster. I don't remember who got it for me. It should, it could have been my mom, but I had these two posters of like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. in my room. And I didn't know the significance. I knew how powerful they were in the movement they were fighting for, but I didn't know the significance of the fight they were trying to fight. And now it's crazy that I have these two huge, you know, influential people in the black history of America on my walls. And today, what they were fighting for, I'm still fighting for today, you know? So that was a little eye opening. And then it just made me understand that, you know, I have a platform I need to continue to use. You know, people might not like me because now I'm getting involved in stuff that is outside football, but it's, I'm, I'm a human being. I, I'm a human being first before a soccer player. So I have to speak out to injustice. I can't just, it, I, now I can't just sit by and let things go by. Like, so, um, yeah, in Canada, we learned about everything. Um, well, you know, I think we're, we're fortunate to have, you know, a manager like Bob, who's always informed. There's never a light conversation <laughs> with Bob. Um, he's always to the point and he, you know, he pushes others to know more, learn more and, and have an opinion. So I think that's huge for our group. And, 
um, you know, again, I've, I've talked to Larry about this, you know, going to Orlando and I've been asked this a couple of times, you know, do you think that this will help, help our group come together and in, and in doing so coming together and being in a confined space, like possibly helping with these conversations and, and opening up somewhat of a dialogue. And, you know, I know you being a leader in our locker room, you will initiate it. I know we've had these, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. on different social issues, you know, yeah. we've had, we've had multiple conversations at a table about something yeah, different yeah, where yeah. we, where we disagree on certain things, yeah, but we come, yeah. come, come to an understanding. So I think it's healthy. Yeah. And I think, you know, moving forward, especially, you know, thinking about Orlando and the amount of time we're going to spend together, I think it's a huge opportunity for us. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think, like you said, we've already had conversations and they were just organic. You know what I mean? They just came up and because we respect everyone, we listen to what they're saying and that's what grows the conversation. I think uh, one of the toughest things, not just on our team, is the language barrier. You know what I mean? I think that when things like this is going on in the world, like it's a hard conversation to have in English to someone mm -hmm. who speaks English and understands it. So imagine trying to have a conversation to someone who speaks a different language. So I, when I look at that, I'm like, that, that is definitely going to be a roadblock, but it's easy to get over that. Um, but I think once these conversations starts, they'll, it'll just be a snowball effect and more guys will understand it. I think we, as a club and as players, I think a lot of us are aware of what's going on in the world. I think a lot of us are aware. I think, maybe some might be scared to have these conversations. We have these conversations, you know what I mean? Because we have that rapport. It's, it's very easy. But I feel like some guys, to bring that up, they might need more of a push from someone else. So uh, like you said, I think Orlando will be, you know, a catalyst in that sense where a lot of conversations are having because, shit, we're going to be sitting at the dinner table for as long as we can. We'll have a few before weeks to learn Spanish back. too. We'll have, yeah, we'll have a few weeks to learn Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> before we have to go back to our rooms or anything. So, yeah, I think something good will come out of that. Yeah. It shouldn't take a negative or unfortunate yeah. event mm -hmm. in your life, my life, everybody's life, society, to have these conversations. We need sure. to continue to have the conversation and hopefully make some progress so that, I agree. Yeah. you know, 40, 50 years from now, People aren't looking back and saying, wow, a hundred years ago, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, I agree. Well, that was, that was awesome, man. I, uh, you know, it, it's a privilege talking with you always. Um, thanks for coming on. Uh, you know, I, uh, in a weird way, I'm, I'm your elder statesman, but I obviously look up yeah. to you because you stand for something. And I really appreciate that as a teammate. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to hopefully a few more years with you, man. <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate it. You guys are doing a good job. You know, I'm glad that I was able to get on, you know, and talk about meaningful things, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's a tough time in the world right now, you know, but I think, you know, through tough times, people come out better on the other side. And I've been preaching that since this whole quarantine thing started. You know, I think the people with the right mentality are going to come out on the other side much better and in a much better position than they were before. Like, you know, so. And, uh, and relationships. Yeah. You're either going to take the yeah. next step. <laughs> yeah. Or, or you're not. You know? Oh, wait. Exactly. This right. would be, this would be like right up there with the oh. Carlos Vela baby reveal. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything to reveal right now. <laughs> All right, maybe another time. But yeah, on a exactly. serious note, Mark Anthony K, um, it has been an honor and a privilege to be in a club with you. Um, you know, I think we first met on the field at Bank of California Stadium right before that first home game. Yeah. And the first – words we exchanged were you asking me do you think I could hold that falcon um yeah. <laughs> and yet you know you talk about how people come through difficult times and you know we all watched how hard you worked to come back from a pretty tough injury and how you have always been a leader 
and kind of one of the guys who stands up for the other guys on the field <laughs> and to have someone from our club step forward to be such a leader and such a strong voice at this time has just been, it's just been incredible. So thank you for that. No, thank you. You know, you guys, you guys make it easy on me, you know, being part of a club that is so caring and passionate about what they're doing. It, 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 it makes it easy for us players to do the right thing. You know, you guys give us the platforms. It's our responsibility to take responsibility to take the ability we have and do something of it. So I'm just glad that I'm making somewhat of an impact, you know, and uh, I hope that we can continue to, you know, make an impact off the field and on the field. Larry, we're back, man. We're back. We're back. We're back. Are you up for doing this in Orlando oh. and kind of through that? Yeah. Okay, cool. I, I am not. Listen, I don't want to take away from the time that you and Mark <laughs> and Dio are playing Xbox. Down uh, I'm not going to be playing video games. So um, the what? preparation for this and the outlines are going to be pinpoint and uh, Orlando, I'll have plenty of time and I'll need desperately need something to take me away from, you know, just sitting in a hotel and, and yeah. uh, you know, well, um, I'm feeling, feeling guilty about my family being here. Uh, um, yeah, maybe I can go over to your place and record from your place. Uh, you know, are you going to be there? Oh, you're, you're, no, you're I mean, your, here. House. Sorry. your house. Hey, Jordan, I'm sitting. I got excited for a second there, Larry. I'm I was drinking. like, Larry's in. Yeah. No. Larry, Larry made the cut. Yeah. No room for me on the bus. Um, yeah. No, no, hey, man. Yeah, um, please. I hope you don't mind. I'm wearing your robe, sitting <laughs> in your chair, drinking your wine. <laughs> That's fine. But there, the, seriously. I, I, I'm going to run, run the house bare by the time you get here. Maybe we bust out like we did at the beginning once a week. Oh, shooting yeah. Shooting the shot podcast. Just grab a player, bring him in. Quick conversation. So I think we should get Bob. And I'll, and I'll so, tell you so why. I listened to his one-on-one -on -one oh, with Jesse great. Marsh. It was awesome. Yeah. And I told him as much, you know, uh, you know, it's funny. You know, he doesn't, and I, t I talk to him every day. He doesn't uh, come off as someone who would want to host a podcast. Correct. Correct. So when I heard that, I was like, I've got to just hear, just to hear how he, how he does it. And it's yeah. great. And he, and I talked to him about the flying coach and how he, you know, it's, it's this more of the Steve Kerr role that he's approaching these podcasts in as, you know, setting up the questions as well as answering them. And, yeah. and um, yeah, I've really, I really enjoyed the Jesse Marshall. I think that would be a fun one. 